So my question is, how worried do we need to be about those Newton Hills? So yes, even though the Boston Marathon has a net downhill, it is a very hilly course, which is something that definitely scares a lot of runners. And as I've been researching, it's what I hear over and over again. Be careful because there's a lot of hills. On top of that, the weather is something else totally beyond our control. And you kind of never know what you're gonna get for Boston. As of right now, it's looking really good with a high of 56, partly cloudy. But who knows, wind, rain might show up. We're really not gonna know until race day. And so at this point, it's just all about pacing strategy, going in, believing in myself, believing in yourself, so we can have the best day possible out there. So if you guys are not familiar with my Boston qualifying journey, I have several other videos where I talk about that, including when I qualified for this particular Boston, which was at Sun Valley in June of 2021. But I've definitely gone through a lot of trying to qualify, qualifying, and then COVID, supposed to be running in 2020, then not getting in. And finally, I will be running the Boston Marathon in less than a week. I could not be more thrilled for the opportunity and just looking forward to going out there with my family and enjoying the day and hoping for a great experience overall. So in December at the California International Marathon, I ran a 3.33 and change. And in my training videos for this Boston lead up, I've been talking about my goal of getting a sub 3.30. So that is still the goal and what I am going to focus on no matter what race day brings. If I have to adapt, adjust, pivot on the day, then I will do that. But as of right now, I am planning and hoping for the best. And that's what's going to be outlined in this video. So the Boston Marathon is the oldest annual marathon in the world and it starts in some towns outside of the city of Boston and then ends in downtown Boston. It has a total elevation gain of about 815 feet, total loss of 1,275 feet, and that equates to a net downhill of 460 feet. Even though it has a net downhill, it's certainly not just going straight from one point and down to the finish line. It couldn't be further from the truth. There are tons and tons of rolling hills. And if you are familiar with elevation changes, any type of hills that are going to be involved in any sort of distance, especially in the marathon, it's going to take a toll on your body as your body has to work harder to get up those hills. However, we also have to remember that you get a little bit of forgiveness when you're running down those hills as well. But ultimately you are expending more energy by having to run uphill. So when I talk about pacing and pacing strategy for any type of race, you want to go in with an even effort as opposed to even pace. Because if you're going in with an even pace strategy, then that means you're ultimately going too fast on any uphill zones and maybe not going as fast as you should on any downhill zones. So I'm going in with an even effort approach with a conservative start, which I always talk about being the best strategy strategy that you want to start out slower so that you can negative split your race. What I've heard over and over again with people talking about the Boston Marathon, those who've run it many times, because I myself have never run it, is that it's just extremely hard to negative split this race. And that's really because of the hills that come in those late, late miles. Pretty hilly section, which we'll go cover, but between the 16 to 21 mile time frame in the race, and that just makes it really difficult to negative split. However, I still want to have a conservative start somewhat. So I got a question on my video, how to pace your best marathon from Marcella, and she is also going to be running the Boston Marathon. So Marcella, if you see me, make sure you say hi. So she asked, Boston starts with downhills. If the recommendation is for even effort and not pace, but it's also to start slower, how do we decide if we should start faster or slower? Great question. And that definitely makes a difference when your race starts on a downhill and then you're expecting a lot of uphill sections later because you kind of think, all right, well, I'm going to be going slower on those uphill sections. And so do I need to start out a little bit faster? So when I say you want to start your race with maybe marathon pace plus 10 or 15 seconds, maybe in a situation like this where you're starting with a pretty steep downhill because it is very significant for Boston, mile one is negative 130 feet um, downhill start. So you're definitely gonna be feeling it and being excited with the crowds. So thinking about how you wanna start that race. So for me personally, 
I'm going to be focusing on kind of staying right around marathon pace, not faster and not slower. So if you're curious about what my marathon pace is going to look like with that 330 time goal, I have that broken down here. I am using findmymarathon.com and I'm just looking at the pace bands for um, the Boston Marathon and the nice thing about this website is that you can choose how you want to start the race what your strategy is as well as what you want your pacing strategy to be overall so I chose to have start strategy of a conservative start and a pacing strategy of even effort so when I'm using that, it's showing me that I should be running mile one around eight minutes, same with mile two, same with mile three, and then getting a little bit faster on that fourth mile. So that's probably what I'm going to plan to stay around, just hovering around that eight minute mile, um, because that's what I'm gonna wanna be finishing close to to get that sub 330. I believe it's like a 758, 759. So this is definitely a stretch for me. So with CIM and running a 333, I have that pulled up and that is an average of an 809 pace. So I actually really negative split that race though. I ran a 148 and change for the half marathon point and then must have been about a 145 for the second half of that. So what I am aiming to do for the Boston Marathon is to take that 145 and run close to that in the first half of Boston and then also run close to that in the second half of Boston as well. So that is the goal. It's definitely a stretch, but I've had a really, really good training cycle. I run a lot more mileage this time around and just changed up some things. So um, I think that I am capable using something like McMillan's cal calculator based on race times I've already done. A 45.20 is my 10K time that I ran in the fall. It's saying I should be able to run around at 3.32. But when you go to Jack Daniels VDOT calculator, it is saying that I should be, run, be able to run a 3.28 something. So we'll just go right in the middle there and hope that with that grit and that drive and the excitement of the day that I can get around that 3.30 time goal that I'm shooting for. Um, I'm definitely gonna be brave, push myself, see what my potential is but ultimately it's all about just having a really good experience out there. All right, so let's go ahead and break down the course and talk about some pacing as we go along. A couple of the tools that I'm using, um, find my marathon, which I already shared, and then um, I read several articles and podcasts, so I'll link any of the things that have helped me below in case you guys wanna check those out, so they'll help you as well. And then on top of that, I've used the Boston Marathon official course preview, which definitely check it out. It gave me chills watching it. They have these champions kind of going over the course and talking to you about it. And it's just really exciting. And it's nice to get a full preview of what that course is going to look like. And then lastly, I found this um, pretty old document uh, from the Boston Archives where they talk about each mile and what you can expect in terms of that elevation change, whether overall it's going to be a negative or positive net change. All right, so the first mile, obviously we're gonna be really, really excited getting out there um, and we're gonna be surrounded by other runners who are feeling the same way. We've got those nerves, we've got that adrenaline going. Um, we've been waiting a long time for this and so it's very common to go out too fast and that's what we definitely want to avoid so for me like I said I want to be conservative I want to be careful and in CIM I really was but I ran too slow I think I ran like at 825 and I didn't need to do it then and I definitely don't need to do that now especially on this much of a downhill CIM was a downhill start as well pretty similar so like I said I'm just gonna kind of hover around that eight minute mile and um, go for even effort there's also gonna be that bottleneck of runners and you don't want to use too much energy trying to weave around other runners. I've heard it's really narrow there. And so I'm just gonna kind of be patient, be calm and know that I have plenty of time ahead of me to make up any time if I do end up going slower than what my goal is in that first mile. So that's Hopkinton. And then for miles two through five, you're gonna be in Ashland. There are some rolling hills with a net downhill overall. In fact, it's a pretty good net downhill. Let's see, you've got negative 40, negative 55, negative 85. Um, and then really just very gently rolling hills in there, but I think it's gonna feel pretty good overall. Then you're getting to Framingham and Natick. And if I pronounce anything wrong, guys, just, you know, 
Mile six through 11, that's where we're gonna be. It's mostly flat with some gentle rollers. In fact, when you look at the elevation chart, you can see that other than this, maybe one between four and five, which it looks a little bit steeper, um, they're just, they're gonna be pretty small. It's probably just gonna kind of feel like this overall, some of those undulations. And for me personally, I'm really, really used to that. I run a lot of that around, around here but it's more about the fact that you're gonna be race pacing. It's not the same, but my body is also very used to uphills and downhills, so I'm thankful for that. All right, so moving into Wellesley Miles, which is 12 through 15. This is what you guys have probably heard of, Wellesley College Scream Tunnel, which I've heard amazing things about that you'll hear it way before you get there, um, that it's just very loud and deafening and exciting. The college girls are there, um, might give you kisses if you're over on the right-hand side, although I heard for 2021, because of COVID, they were not doing this, but who knows how it's gonna be in 2022. I know everyone's gonna be excited to kind of be feeling like things are getting back to normal this year and that it's actually on Marathon Monday, finally, Patriots Day. This section is a net uphill. Uh, again, you're just getting those hills, um, but we're down and around um, 165, 145 feet above sea level at this point. So going back to my experiences, I am in a suburb of Denver, Colorado, where I run at about 6,000 feet. So I also have that going for me. Being at sea level is definitely going to feel very good. Uh, my lungs definitely felt really good when I was in Sacramento with that same situation. So I am definitely looking forward to that. For that half marathon point that came right before that, um, my goal is to come in around 145. But really, if I'm anywhere between kind of a 144 to 146, I think that's a really good place for me to be. Uh, I don't, even though people say it's hard to negative split, I don't want to go with an, in with this mindset of that I won't negative split uh, just because I know me and how I like to approach races. So if I am more at that like 146 mark, that's totally fine. Um, like I said, with CIM, I went three minutes faster in the second half. So um, that's what I am shooting for. Uh, if I'm really going more, though, for kind of an ease, even pacing strategy overall, as opposed to negative splitting, just because I think this course lends itself better to something like that. All right, so then we're getting into Newton Lower Falls. So this is kind of where you get that last nice big downhill before you move into the Newton Hills. Uh, you get this uh, steepest descent, I think, of the entire race. And then once you do that, then you get this steeper uphill that's up to the Route 128 overpass. I've heard it's very, very loud there. That lots, lots of traffic is below you, honking. Um, so that's probably really cool, maybe a little bit overwhelming as well. And I've also heard that any sort of weather is going on, wind, rain, you know, you're very exposed to the ele elements at this kind of higher point. So just to keep that in mind as well. All right, so then we're getting to these Newton Hills. So this is 16 through 21. So as I'm approaching the Newton Hills, this is where I want to feel like I have all of the energy to tackle that. I don't wanna feel like I've banked time to make up time because the hills are gonna slow me down because that's just not a good way to approach those hills. And you just wanna feel like you're taking them one by one and not worrying so much about your watch and your pace. So I'm really not going to be. Um, I think that this is an advantage that I had at CIM was going up the hills. I would have a lot of people pass me on the uphill and then I would pass them on the downhill because really I want to use that hill to my advantage, slow down on the uphill, conserve my energy on the uphill, uphill, and then be able to take those quick steps down the hill and let gravity pull me down. So that's gonna be my goal for these four big hills. We have um, four hills ranging from two to 4% grade, the Washington Hill, Brayburn Hill, John Kelly Hill, and what we've all heard of is Heartbreak Hill. So what I've heard big time with these hills is that not that they're so steep, but that where they are in the course, that they do cover a large chunk of mileage within the race and they're pretty late in the race as well. So once you get to the top of Heartbreak Hill, you still have 5.2 miles to go at that point. And that's, that's quite a bit. And so you don't wanna feel like the race is done because that's also when people often 
hit a wall. And that's why it's really important to pace yourself well up until this point and feel like you have a lot of energy for those 5.2 miles. And then you get to what's called the haunted mile. And this is a quote I read where contenders go to die. Basically some of the people who may be in the lead or doing really, really well at that point at the top of Heartbreak Hill, then they kind of lose it in that next mile. And I've also read that because it used to start to get this stark downhill after Heartbreak Hill is is that it can be really, really rough on your quads, especially if you haven't trained well on hills or if you went out too fast. So keep in mind that just because it's downhill after 21 doesn't mean that you're not gonna be hurting. And honestly, naturally in a marathon, you're hurting at that point anyway. Um, it's just very normal. And so you have to use those mantras, tap into them, whatever works for you, grit down, and just know that you're gonna be done soon. And this is a big deal and to keep going. I know that's what I'm gonna be telling myself as well as using the crowds to my advantage. So um, Boston College is here. There's a lots of, lot of students, lots of crowds, a lot of spectators. And so my favorite thing about CIM was the spectators in those last several miles of the race. I really felt like it was kind of an out of body experience. I almost felt like I couldn't feel my legs and I just kept going and I would lock my eyes with a spectator and smile and yell back to them. And I think that that is what helped me run those fastest miles um, of CIM, honestly running in the 740s and 750s times that I didn't think I was capable of in a marathon. And I think that that's why I'm feeling pretty confident going into the Boston Marathon. But again, every race is different. Uh, they're humbling experiences, they owe you nothing. And so it's still something I need to make sure I'm being really smart about going into as well as I encourage you to do the same. So then at mile five, that's when you see the sit go sign. And I've heard it's like just big and there for a really long time. You think you're almost done, but you're actually not. I'm just hoping the crowds will carry me at that point. I know I'm going to be in a lot of pain, just like everyone. Um, and then it's what we've all heard of that right on here for left on Boylston. Those are the last two turns coming down that street and just seeing the crowds, hoping to see my family there as well. Um, and just being carried by the crowds. That's that's what I expect it to be like. I expect it to be very loud and hopefully a smile plastered to my face, no matter what I feel like at that point. And that's that Copley Square finish. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Definitely feeling all the feels this week. Wishing everyone the best of luck who will be running the Boston Marathon. I appreciate everyone's support so much. I'm going to be packing here soon. As always, thanks so much for joining me. I will catch you guys in that packing video and then on the flip side of the Boston Marathon.